Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Week 15 Weekly Update. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. So, Keith, what have we got in our update this week? Thank you, Richard. Well, there wasn't much news this week or that uh, we felt was important, so we're going to get straight into the charts. Okay, now this, I think, shows what the market is expecting and you can see top left here that the consensus estimates for u.s earnings growth are very strong so they're expecting strong growth in q q1 2021 very strong growth in q2 and then for the foreseeable future very strong earnings growth and the question you'd have to ask is, are expectations getting ahead of themselves? Particularly, we know input prices are rising. And the question is, will companies be able to maintain margins and grow earnings as input prices in the form of labor and raw materials continue to rise? Also, there's a, there's a t- corporation tax issue looming, isn't there, in America? Yes. And that would, that would uh, affect earnings per share. Absolutely. And on the, the um, topic of inflation, this is the number of times companies have mentioned inflations in, a, in their earnings calls. And you can see it's picked up. It's now the highest that it's been since before, well, just after the um, financial crisis, yeah. when again, we had very strong um, commodity price growth. Mm. But what is different this time is that companies are now concerned about labor, which is really surprising actually, given that you have high unemployment rates still, and we know you have very high input price, raw material inflation, and actually companies are mentioning labor price inflation more. It's partly that caused by the uh, handouts from the US government that pay people more to stay at home than to go at work. And maybe that will fall away in due course. You'd hope so. Yeah. Um, And uh, but when we look at market valuation, you can see that the market is currently on a very high forward PE multiple. So the market is expensive. There's a lot of optimism in this market and any disappointments in the form of corporate earnings could cause a large downgrade. But the U.S. seems to be recovering. People are on the move again. The uh, daily travels to U.S. airports are the highest since the start of the pandemic, though some way down. And we would wonder whether business travel will recover, ever recover to the levels it had before the pandemic as people use Zoom. Yeah. Richard. So this is the uh, US economic activity uh, chart that I sometimes put up just for small businesses. And uh, obviously Keith was just talking about uh, companies on the, um, the listed exchanges, but this is uh, his small businesses which tend not to be listed and uh, are a different kettle of fish, really. So, we're, we're showing that uh, small business revenue really simply isn't recovering from last summer and it's down, still down around 30% from uh, pre COVID periods. And on the next chart, we've got the uh, small businesses open, which actually is on a downward trend. Mm. And uh, having risen up to a loss of about 20% in, in the summer, it's down to nearly a loss of nearly 40%. And that's extraordinary. Yeah. And that must be hugely damaging for the underlying structure of the US economy. Mm. And 
I think at the moment it's being hidden by the vast handouts from the federal government. And yeah. if they stop, then uh, something quite unpleasant is likely to come out, I think. Well, I think these are really good charts you've included, Richard, because if you look at the markets, you're getting one story. But then when you look at the underlying data, you're getting a completely different story. Also, and I wonder whether the uh, number of small businesses, which you showed, this data shows are decreasing. I mean, they've been kept alive with government stimulus. And now as that rolls off, mm -hmm. I wonder whether you're seeing some of these zombie companies having to close. Yeah. And I think you could probably use these charts as being analogous in Europe and the UK. Uh, obviously, there may be some differences, but I don't see why they should be particularly different in the US to here. Mm. So what these charts are showing is actually serious and ongoing damage from the pandemic, yeah. which we are not seeing reflected in public equity markets. And we're not seeing it reflect in public equity markets because there is so much government money being spent, in my, in my view, mm. and, and it's, uh, it's hiding the, the effect of this damage at the moment. We'll see. But it's certainly something to be very aware of when you're managing your portfolio. Mm. Yeah. Markets are very optimistic, but actually the underlying data, on, and small businesses are the majority of the economy still, yeah. are not doing well. And to reiterate that, this is the uh, nowcast from the New York Fed, which shows their estimate based live on as economic data comes in. They for revise their forecast of, in this case, 2021 Q2 GDP growth. And you can see that in the past three weeks, it's been massively downgraded and we thought it would start recovering a, a couple of weeks ago, but actually it's not really. So this kind of backs up Richard's data showing that actually things aren't looking as good as perhaps the markets are saying. Okay, so a few graphs on the COVID crisis. So first one shows that UK is doing very well. Uh, the blue line is UK deaths from COVID-19 and the white line is those in France. And you can see that earlier in the year we were doing very badly. But since the vaccine campaign has got going, deaths in the UK have absolutely collapsed, which is obviously very good for the UK. But continental Europe, in this case France, are not doing so well. And you'll know that there are various travel restrictions come back in in France. And when we think about the travel industry, you know, international travel is not going to come back strongly if nobody can go on holiday. No. I also noticed, I think, Keith, today, uh, Chancellor Merkel is talking about Germany locking down hard again, um, which clearly is bad for them, bad for their economy and, and bad for travel and bad for the European economy. Oh, dear. And this is the UK cases per million. And this is nice. We're doing very, very well, frankly. Mm -hmm. And what's noticeable is that the Sweden, who were you know, never locked down, are now doing incredibly badly. But the ch point of this chart is actually not about the Scandinavian experience. It's about seasonality. And the fact that during the summer months, COVID-19, like flu, just goes away and we are going into the summer months. So I think it's if you look at the German and the European data, it'd be quite easy to get pessimistic. But I think in Q2, the weather and the vaccination programs get going. And I hope by the summer you'd have very few cases in Europe and perhaps travel will come back. One of the one of the issues we seem to have, though, Keith, is obviously we've got the we've got surge testing in various parts of London for the South African variant. And mm. I was having a look today. and There seems to be um, sort of mixed up reviews on how well the existing vaccines work against the South African variant, with some some vaccines appearing to be highly effective against it and others less effective. And the the longer the COVID rolls around the world because it's a global problem, the more variants we're going to get and the more complex the vaccination, vaccination program needs to be. And 
hopefully the UK government is with its effective vaccination program is on top of this. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but all governments need to be on top of the hugely complex exercise of ordering the right vaccines for the right variants at the right times. And obviously the manufacturers need to make them. Mm. And we also need to be careful. I think that we don't chuck out vaccines that are effective, but have a very, a very rare side effect and saying we can't use them when actually the number of lives saved is yeah. disproportionately large. Um, and I think we have to be careful we don't get ourselves into a complete mess with that. Mm. Well, I would hope the last lockdown is the last one. Yeah. I mean, currently the death rates in the UK are so low that yeah. I don't think any restrictions would be justifiable. Okay, on to markets. Well, when we look at the um, bullish versus bearish indicator, everyone is bullish. I mean, it's not as extreme bullish as perhaps it was earlier in the year, but everyone's pretty bullish. Yeah. And as evidence of that, SPAC madness in the US. Now, so the amount of capital raised by SPACs, obviously, in Q1 is at breached all um, previous records. However, I read in the FT that the next stage of a SPAC where they actually, having found a company they wish to buy, where they then try and raise funding, they are having problems because the debt markets are being asked to fund vast numbers of these SPACs at very high valuations and they're struggling to get funding. So that is something to watch. Yeah. Also, I noticed that I think the SEC is starting to step in and look into, into the, these SPACs. And I suspect that we will see in future months, the chart goes back down to um, having risen up in a sheet steep spike, it drops back mm. down. And frankly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch any of these with barge pole. And I bet in three or four years time, they've all gone bust. Well, <laughs> I've said that about quite a lot of these dodgy companies like like Uber's never made a profit. Yeah. And it's still valued at 54 <laughs> billion or something. So, you know, there's the uh, I don't know which wise man said the market can remain. Um, the market can thought, remain irrational the longer, longer you can remain, remain solvent. solvent. <laughs> yes. Actually, it was Keynes. And um, this I thought was just interesting. So this gives you the um, size of a modern cruise ship versus the Titanic. And it shows just how much larger a modern sh cruise ship is. So if you add together the um, passengers and crew of the Titanic, there are about 3,300 people on board, mm -hmm. whereas a modern cruise ship has 9,000. So we're getting to the point, Keith, that icebergs need to keep out of the way of cruise ships. <laughs> yes. Anyway. So it does make you wonder if something were to happen to one. I mean, in the case of the costs of Concordia, they were very close to shore and they managed to get most yeah. of the people off. But, you yeah. know. So onto the checklist. Well, it was a great week. It was a great week for markets. Um, all share was up one and a half percent. S&P 500 up one point eight. NASDAQ actually slightly underperformed the uh, S&P, it was only up 1.5. Topics, Japanese index was up 0.1. Bitcoin had a great week, up 4.7%. And sterling um, was up half a percent. Mm -hmm. Richard? Yes, yeah, so this is a long-term chart of the FTSE 100, Keith, where you can see it has, in effect, gone nowhere for uh, 20, 20 years, since 1999, um, where it was again at 7,000. And I, a lot of people saying the FTSE is a good buy, and it may well be. And I think it, the interesting point is what happens if it breaks through that top line? Is it actually on course to, to, for a significant uh, rise? And uh, I suspect it may be, actually, with all the money that's swallowing, floating around the system. Um, clearly, it broke through in 2017-ish, and then it went dropped back down it. So it's, um, it's interesting. I think uh, your, your comment on oil um is that uh, you know a lot of there are a lot of resource companies in the FTSE resources are doing well will probably continue to do well under the current regime so i like the FTSE in principle right um so bitcoin um 
it, it is reaching a new all-time high. It is, it's dropped back. I, I mean, this morning, this afternoon, as we speak, it's, I think it's down about 5%. So it's, it's been very volatile here, and the rate of decline has obviously slowed down substantially, but it is still continuing to reach new all-time highs. Mm. As a technical analyst, Richard, would you say that this, the rate of change is kind of, it's topping out the rate? Yeah. I would agree with that. If you put it on a logarithmic curve, it would it would have a slope, a downward, um, it would have a concave slope, wouldn't it? Ethereum, um, actually, Ethereum really spiked up quite sharply, didn't it? And it again is is down quite quite a lot this morning, but again, you know, it's reaching a new all time high. And I'm, I, who knows? To have a small, my advice is. If you want some, have a small position and, and hold it. And if it gets too big for comfort, sell sell a chunk of it and keep it small. And um, and the last last is that our favourite chart ever, I think, of <laughs> the shit per crypto chart, which we introduced last week. And as you can see, that is still moving up. So you can't beat shit per, I would say, for investment. <laughs> I know, Keith. For now, you went out and bought a load last week, didn't you, Keith? I certainly didn't, Richard. <laughs> Anyway, moving on to the industrial commodities, which again, you know, strong. So aluminium up 2.7%, cobalt was flat, copper up 2%, going back towards its highs, iron ore up 3.5%, back towards its highs. Lithium um, was, it's very, the chart we use is very illiquid, frankly, um, and it was flat, neodymium. The neodymium price we use again, I question the that is the bid price and the bid offer spread is absolutely enormous. So it's about 30 percent. So how accurate some of these prices are is open to question. But anyway, um, down slightly on the week. Nickel was down again. We've covered nickel in previous um, weeklies. Uh, the ferro-vanadium price ticked up slightly. WTI had a very strong week. So the EIA came out upgrading their forecasts for oil consumption on the back of a strong recovery this year. That was very good for WTI. And uranium came off. Now, if we talk about oil further, this was in today's FT. And this is very good for oil prices because it's showing that perhaps after two disastrous oil cycles for private equity, they're finally learning their lesson. So the story of the last two oil cycles is that shale got ahead of itself and shale oil production grew very rapidly and swamped the market, killing prices. And shale was only able to do that because they got massive funding from private equity. Throughout the, all those cycles, they never made positive cash flow. So they were drilling new wells funded by private equity, not funded by profits because they didn't have any. Yeah. Um, but the oil rig count is rising, but it's still a long way down. If you think about the oil price, is back to its previous highs, but the rig count is half those levels. So that mm -hmm. is actually evidence of discipline. Presumably, there's a, there's a limit into how fast the rig count can grow because of the uh, the fixed supply of drilling rigs. Uh, but one thing you would notice, Keith, is that we you know in the past there have been large steep rises off um, off the lows. And it looks like the angle of the rise is about the same, doesn't it? And post, you know, of the one in 2009 and the one in 2016. So well, the thing is, Richard, I'm going to disagree with you there because there are a lot of rigs. You know, rig, rigs on is not a constraint. And also, I would say this is actually a slightly shallower yeah. rise. And given the change in the oil price over this period, I think the um, rig count is definitely lagging because they're having to fund dr the new drills from cash flow. Yeah. And that's what we'd hope. The other point I'd make is on this chart is that we've seen everything 
shoot up hugely mm. dramatically from last summer, but this hasn't. Mm. Um, That's true. We've seen things regaining their previous highs and surpassing their previous highs and so forth. And this simply is behaving differently. And if you don't think it's because there's a constraint on the number of rigs that can um, mm. can be put up over the period of time, then that suggests that, that it is moving more slowly than many other things. Yeah, which is good for the oil price. Yes. And but the great news this week is that after a couple of weeks where U.S. oil inventories were rising, and I couldn't quite understand why they were rising, frankly, they have started dropping again. And that means that oil supply is less than demand. And actually, last week, it was substantially less than demand. So total crude plus products, including the Special Petroleum Reserve, which is the U.S. strategic reserve of petroleum, it was down 10 million barrels. So the U.S. used 10 million barrels more than the supply last week, which is great for oil prices. But in the U.S., at least, investors have been really buying into energy. So, you know, it's been the biggest inflows into energy uh, of all the ETFs. Energy was by far the most popular over the last four weeks. Yeah. However, in Europe, I just don't think that's the set true. So this chart shows the performance of crude oil, which is the blue line over the past um, 18 months. And you'll see over that period, it's up 1.2%. Whereas BP and Shell, BP and Orange, Shell in Aquamarine, are down 41% over the period. And that, in a chart, shows frankly, the relatively poor performance of my own portfolio over the last mm. you know, few months, in that my assumption has been that if the oil price rises, then oil companies should do well. In fact, they should be geared to the oil price. And that ain't happened. I guess that will come through in cash flows in due course, won't it, Keith? Because they, they will be making the same level of profit now as they were making at the start of this chart. Um, so one would expect... Well, Unless BP has invested so much in, in loss-making green energy that it actually can't um, make that level of Well, profit. that's the thing, Richard. I mean, what I would say is in the short term, you would very much hope its, con it's production from legacy assets would do it mean that it generates a lot of cash. Yeah. But going forwards, the performance of those legacy assets will decline. This is over years rather than months, though. And in the meantime, BP is pouring money into green assets such as offshore wind farms for which it has paid up at a premium. And is, I think the market is unconvinced that the future strategies, the green strategy, will be as uh, profitable as the old strategy. And it's falling between two stools in that the ESG buyers, um, invest investors won't touch it because it's still largely oil. And yield investors are looking at its strategy thinking, mm. really, does yeah. this work? This yeah. doesn't look remotely as profitable as uh, the stuff we know you're good at. Yeah. Um, and on that note, you can see that the U.S. majors are at double the cash flow multiple of the European ones, in part, I think, because the U.S. ones are just committed to doing what they know they're good at, which is oil and gas, whereas BP and Shell are now doing uh, hydrogen and you know stuff paying up for green energy. Yeah. Uranium, Richard. So obviously last week we had um, quite a nice bump in the price of uranium and this week um, we've had uh, a pullback. I mean, using my Fibonacci head here, Keith, I can see that the pullback was probably around about 40%. So in the scheme of things, it wasn't enormous. But for those of us who are hoping that the price of uranium was going to continue going upwards, it was a bit of a blow. Um, notwithstanding that, I am long-term bullish on the price of uranium. What it does over the course of a week is obviously irrelevant. So um, it's, uh, I think all the, all the constituent pieces are in place for the price to rise significantly. 
Well, this is one of the things where we have a disagreement, Richard, in that I've just heard this uranium story too too long and too often. It's for five years, everyone's been saying that there's going to be this huge shortage in uranium. And hmm, it's come off again. <laughs> yes. well, you can see that Ethan and I don't fix this, this uh, podcast because we don't always do the same things. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, now, on the, the charts, we've shown that commodity prices continue to do well. And that is in part because investors are really interested in this super cycle story that years of underinvestment in commodities will now lead through to rising prices as the world recovers from COVID-19 and there's a shortage of metals in particular for the um, clean tech revolution. Mm. But speculative positioning looks stretched. This is copper futures and shows the um, net longs, which are very high by historic standards. Yeah. But that said, Goldman Sachs have come out and massively <laughs> revised upwards their copper price forecast. Well, I think and, um, Goldman Sachs agree with us, don't they, Keith, that um, yeah. there is a huge, going to be a huge demand for copper for infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, electricity grid, and it can't be met by current production. Yeah, absolutely. They saw it here first, I suspect. <laughs> um, and there's, so they're saying the price has to rise. Otherwise, stocks will be depleted by September 2022, mm. current rates. So something to watch. We will be... Um, so Rambler Metals is a copper company we really like. Yeah. Um, and we will be, I will be looking at Pembroke Resources over the next couple of weeks as we search for opportunities to take advantage of this. Yeah. This is the copper price heading back up towards its highs. Um, and this actually is a chart showing the ratio of commodity prices to the S&P. And, you know, what they're saying is if it reverts to norm, then it could go a long way. And actually, this has been surprisingly volatile. If you look at ratio of... Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the danger with this sort of chart is it, it assumes that conditions don't change, doesn't it, over the long term? And yeah. um, if conditions have changed, then the chart is is um, not really relevant. And it's difficult to know um, where, to what extent, there might be a reversion to that thick black line um, because of um, basically a, a lack of supply of commodities and to what extent they may not be because conditions have changed um, uh, it's, uh, well, the, it's useful but you can't bet the bank on a chart no, absolutely and the other thing i'd say richard is that it also depends on the performance of the s p in the form of you know all these very highly valued tech stocks if yeah. they come down then you know this ratio will rise even if commodities don't do anything so yeah. you know um, lithium, as we've discussed, doing very nicely. Thank you very much. And this, I thought, was a great chart. And this shows the price of a lithium iron pack over the last 10 years. And you know, this is a massive collapse in the price. So obviously, you know, demand for uh, when we look at the relative merits of batteries, you know, this the collapse in the price of lithium iron packs is a great for the energy transition and b lithium iron versus other battery technologies i mean this has to make lithium absolutely the most cheapest option and the most competitive yeah another thing about that chart i think keith is that although it looks like it's flattening out if you were to zoom in on 2019 to 2021 you probably find it was continuing its exponent, its asymptotic approach to zero. Yeah. Well, we actually did talk about a few weeks ago the um, price packs of lithium ion batteries in China yeah. going below a hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Um, and this, I thought, it's a forecast from Bloomberg New Energy of um, 
global lithium ion battery demand. And this is amazing. I mean, if this is even remotely true, you're talking about enormous increases in battery demand. So I don't think I'd say here, Keith, is I mean, talk about roughly speaking, an eightfold increase in over the next nine years. But my concern, I've mentioned it here before, is we don't have the electricity infrastructure to charge these yeah. things. And no, at some agree. point, this is the reality of this situation is going to hit. And I don't think the central planners, politicians and uh, the green aficionados have thought it through. And I'm all in favour of, of um, not burning fossil fuels and so forth. But I don't think this problem has been thought through. No, I agree with you. Um, but the demand in lithium over the last five years really has been extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at um, 2015, lithium iron demand was only 32% of a total market of 174,000 tonnes. It's now 67% of 398,000 tonnes. So essentially all marginal demand has come from lithium iron. So, you know, historic trends, if extrapolated, will lead to massive increases in lithium demand. Um, this is iron ore which despite my skepticism has continued heading towards highs. I mean, my thoughts are that iron is um, abundant in the earth's crust. And generally when the iron ore spikes, then um, you get a supply response, but it's continuing towards highs. Okay, on to the checklist for precious metals and the fall in interest rates over the past week allowed uh, precious metals to rise. So gold was up 1.7, silver was up 3.6, platinum came off a bit, down 1.8, rhodium still a very elevated, but down 1.7%, uh, and palladium had a good week. Richard, do you want to talk through these? Yeah, well, obviously the gold is, uh, has been declining since mid-summer, Keith, hasn't it? And it sort of, um, it's it hasn't, um, from the chart point of view, it hasn't broken that decline, but clearly it's bounced very nicely off around about six, the price of 1680 up to 1770. Um, I read somewhere that if you take the real interest rate, it currently is being about minus 1%, which you, one can do, um, depending on your view of what the rate of inflation is. And it was minus 1% in, uh, the real rate was also minus 1% in July, August time. And so in that, on that basis, the price of gold should be substantially higher than it is now. I mean, I have a long-term gold ball. I think it will get there. I just think it's taking its time to, to uh, adjust. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm not convinced it's particularly tied to the, the interest rate. I think it's more tied to the breakdown of the financial, of the financial system through all the QE and, and um, money printing that we've got. But uh, it is moving if you happen to uh, like gold to move in the right direction. And then silver is in a uh, range that it's been in since uh, the summer, last summer, uh, between around about 22 and uh, $29. It's bang in the middle of that range now. And I think if you were a, a chartist, you'd say it really needed to get above, let's say $29 in order to confirm that it was moving up to a higher, a consistently higher price than it is now. And um, it had that quick breakout in February where the, uh, the Reddit crowd decided that they would they would do a short squeeze on silver, and that, that didn't happen. Um, so, you know, it's, um, we shall see. And palladium, I think this is a very good looking chart. Palladium is um, steadily rising as I, th I think companies are substituting rhodium for palladium and rhodium price is um, very elevated, obviously. Okay, so moving on to the checklist for rates. And last week, rates actually came off. So bond prices rose, in part because of supported noises from the Federal Reserve. Um, but inflation expectations are well anchored, and the fall in um, interest rates has allowed, for example, precious metals to rise. But I remain concerned that inflation is on the rise. And we've seen that from the earlier chart showing companies talking about input price pressures, both from labor and raw materials. 
And I worry that uh, inflation is going to pick up and interest rates will have to rise. At some stage, the big question is whether central banks will allow bond yields to rise with inflation or will intervene in the market to cap rates. And if they cap rates, then precious metals go through the roof. And it's, we have to wait and see to how they react. So this is what I was con talked about there just then. This is um, companies mentioning supply constraints in their earnings um, discussions. This is the 30-year gilt yield and 10-year rates, both of which show that rates have stopped rising. And finally, the seasonality chart, which seems to be a quite remarkably good guide to what's happening in the market. We're in mid-April and the market's shooting up. So according to this chart, next week will be kind of flattish. By, we'll by, um, by the end of May, Keith, the FTSE will be 33%, I beg your pardon, 3% higher. So Keith's yeah. prediction is the FTSE will be at 7,200 at the end of May. Yeah. Uh, I, I find this, this so far this year, this has just been remarkably accurate. <laughs> yeah. We should give up, Richard, and just, you know, <laughs> stick this chart up. Yes. Anyway, yeah. I think that's it for now. And Richard will now go through his activity. Thank you, Keith. So this week, um, my portfolio was up 1.8%. Um, I had a, quite a, a decent week with gold mine, gold and silver miners, actually. Uh, which primarily accounts for it. I suffered a, a bout of FOMO with Touchstone Exploration and Predator Oil and Gas. And um, Keith will tell you something that's quite amusing in a few minutes. And um, I have shares in um, Sylvania and uh, Jubilee Platinum. And I also had the Platinum Metal ETF. And I needed actually to free up a bit of cash. So I sold the Platinum ETF and put it into Touchstone Exploration, Penetra Oil and Gas, which may or may not have been a wise decision. Time will tell. Um, we are talking small quantities here, small numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, my exposure to platinum through the share, through the share, those two shares is, is fine. I'm comfortable with that. So here's Touchstone. It, uh, it made an announcement that went down very poorly with the market. But um, I did read, not in any detail, I'm not a guru on this, but I did read that people thought the market had misinterpreted what was going on. So I thought it was an opportunity to, to um, pick a little bit up, which I did. And I'm now about 10 or 12% off, which is not where I wanted to be. But on the old Fibonacci, it, you know, hit the 6118, bang on. So I'm confident that it will now rise well above 200 in due course. <laughs> um, and Predator Oil and Gas, I, um, I, my timing, I don't profess actually to be any good at timing the market. I just thought that um, it seems to be quite a good story and I just thought it would be quite interesting to have a holding in it. And um, I sort of, I bought about three days ago, so I'm also down on that one. So this yeah. is an object lesson, lesson in how not to buy your shares. <laughs> and then, I thought you were a te technical guru, Richard. <laughs> I'm not, Keith. I'm not. So then Keith asked me to use my non-technical guru skills to have a look at ferro alloy resources. So this is quite interesting. So this is the long-term chart. It only, obviously only goes back to 19 when uh, the shares were listed or relisted or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of con long-term context. And then what's happened in that little spike up in the last couple of months? So it obviously went up from 10 to 45 or so. It dropped back down to around halfway between the 50 and the 60, one, 618 Fibonacci retracement, which it hit and bounced nicely off. And now it's basically just fluctuating around this level. So I'm quite comfortable that it is consolidating. And if you look at the, um, it's, it's a, still at 10% of the NPV of the, um, of yes. the, um, uh, of the resource and so forth. So, it's got it's got a very competent chairman coming in 
uh, with a lot of credibility. So I think it's uh, you know it's a whole, but it it went very far, very fast, and now it needs a bit of consolidation. Actually, on that note, before you move on, Richard, mm -hmm. I finished reading this week a book called The World for Sale, which was about the commodity traders. And actually, it had talks quite a lot about Sir Mick Davies, oh, right. who is now the chairman of yeah. Ferro Allo Resources. And yeah. it talks about him being, he was brought in to run Extrata by Glassenberg, right. who is the head of Glencore. Yeah. And essentially the two fell out because Glassenberg was expecting um, Mick Davies to run Extrata you know, independently, but with some, um, you know, basically be a client of Glencore. And he absolutely right. refused to. He, actually, he then drove hard bargains between Extrata and Glencore, and the two had a big falling out. So he's quite hard nosed. He was not a puppet. He wasn't a puppet. And I came away thinking, we've, you know, he's a good man to have involved, yeah. frankly. Yeah. He has got a, he's got a fantastic track record, hasn't he? Yeah. Now you're, you're investing in the man as well as the, uh, the, the opportunity. And, and Keith and I do a bit of angel investing. And one of the most important things with angel investing is invest in the person. Yeah. Um, and I think with a small company like this, the, the person at the top is key. And then the other one we, we thought we'd do is Rambler Metals and Mining. So this again, this is to put it into long term perspective. This one goes back to 2005. Um, and we're going to be looking at this region here which on the long-term chart, nothing is happening. Um, and so it had a spike up in the um, beginning of April from 0.3-ish to 0.5, you know, about, it doubled roughly. And again, it, it fell back sharply, and it is now around about the 50% Fibonacci retracement, which is fine. Uh, if, it's, if it is a long-term uptrend, the shape of the movement will be up, down, up, down, up, down. Mm. So it's not doing anything untoward or unexpected. I think that it's doing it quite fast. Mm. And uh, that's quite unnerving. I mean, the fast up isn't unnerving, but the fast down is definitely unnerving. So again, I would say it's not doing anything unexpected. It is uncomfortable, but it's a great prospect and it's a mm. good hold. Well, I, um, I was away for much this week. And I was watching the uh, price of Rambler going through the roof with some dismay, actually, because I was, <laughs> hadn't bought quite as much as I wanted to. So I was going to, uh, so I wanted your advice, Richard, on whether I should buy some more. Um, so oh. I think I'll just average in a bit more. I'm, I'm glad I put my entire ISA holding for this year <laughs> into Rambler. <laughs> Read, the well Read the disclaimer, but I guess a 50% pullback if you wish yeah. to buy it, is fifty percent uh, Fibonacci. It's actually quite a good place to buy it. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Put it. Good. So that's uh, that's my my update, Keith. Perhaps you could. Great. Wills. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Um, I had a decent week. I was up one point seven percent, which takes me up to six point two percent on the year, which means I continue to underperform the all share. And that is almost entirely due to the continued underperformance of my oil shares. And my assumption was that as the oil price recovered, then the oil companies would do very well. And over, particularly over the last quarter, they have massively underperformed the oil price. And I continue to hold them. And I think that their cash flow over the next few months will force the market to take notice. But having said that, Richard bought Touchstone and I sold it <laughs> because, frankly, I didn't like the way the share price was behaving. Right so, now, it's, you're looking like the more, the more clever of the two of us. <laughs> well, you know, I've made a small profit um, and I thought, you know, discretion is the better part of valor. So, so I haven't put in the gain, but it was about 5% gain. So I bought it here and then, so this is the uh, disappointing news about one of their wells, which when they appraised it, turned out to be more oil than gas and it collapsed. And then they had some good 
um, exploration news. And since then, the share price have drifted off really quite rapidly. And I don't like that. So they have another well coming up later in the year. And I will be watching to see if I want to get in be again before that. But the uh, direction of the share price, um, I didn't like. OK, so the only share I bought was Castillo Copper, which is a company with a development copper mine in Australia and um, share price has ticked up and I will try and cover it. But it's again one of these uh, pre-development opportunities where you know, still a long way from having an operating mine. And we are on the lookout for good copper opportunities. And if anyone watching has some suggestions, then please send them through. Yeah, absolutely. So there were updates during the week on a few companies that we have covered and which I own. So Anglo-Asian was frankly disappointing because they announced that 2021 gold production would be down 10% on the closure of the Uga mine, which is now being depleted. Now, when I did my share talk on Anglo-Asian, I used the latest company presentation, which did not mention the Uga mine as being close to deple depletion. In fact, it talked about how there were exploration opportunities in Uga Deep. So therefore, this came as a bit of a surprise to me. Now, the reason we like Anglo-Asian is because of the return of their mining assets once the uh, after the end of hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And that remains true. So it's an exploration upside story. Uh, and I continue to hold the shares. Moving on to capital drilling. I mean, this I thought it was a great update and the share price has ticked up slightly, but you know, we highlighted the shares as being good value and growth. So quarterly revenues were up 35% year on year and 27% quarter on quarter. And it's still got a P ratio of 9.6. So this is both growth and value. And I have put in a limit order to buy some more this morning, although I noticed that there are shares were quite difficult to get hold of. So we will see. But um, I still think that is a very good growth story, and particularly now that uh, precious metals prices are rising again. And finally, Petro Matad have updated and that they've actually managed to get through to the Mongolian government. And although they haven't got the exploitation license, they are getting there. And also they've secured 1.5 million of short term funding. So I remain positive on Petro Matad. Um, Tecmar, which we like, and I am going to redo our share talk on in the near future uh, because the shares have been frankly disappointing, but it's a clean energy play and it's just announced another contract in China. So it's one of a company with global sales and selling into China. Um, and the share price have ticked up slightly. And I think if you believe in the offshore wind market will be going strongly, yeah. then I just cannot see why the tech market share price has been coming down. And I think that's an opportunity. Yeah. And Rambler, yeah, annoyed, frankly, that the share price has shot up so much when I've been steadily accumulating, steadily accumulating over here. And then I go away on holiday hiking for five days and shoot through the roof. Anyway, I will be um, accumulating a bit more. Yeah. So I think that's it. All that remains to say is thank you for watching. I hope you press like and subscribe. And it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. 
Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.